on any of that stuff. All right, so done with the public service announcements. How about let's get into a message, amen? amen. All right, I want to talk to you, uh, made for his presence. We've been doing a series the last few weeks on what, what am I made for. Pastor Carolyn did a wonderful job last week. Were you blessed by that? She talked about made for abiding in Jesus. So I want to uh, segue off of that. Made for his presence, it's a subject we like to talk about around here, but I haven't actually talked about this in a while, so I think you'll be blessed. And so uh, if you weren't here, and you, you, I really encourage you to listen to her message. It was very, very touching. She shared a couple of important uh, encounters and visions she had with the Lord and lots of word around that. It was really, really impacting. All right, so as I started this series off, God created us in his image, right? We were created for something more than just being here on planet Earth, going through pain, suffering, and then one day we pass on and we're with Jesus, right? He created us to live with him, to fellowship with him, to be with him, and to enjoy him, right? And so his original design, his original intent for us was to walk in close relationship with him. He designed us, again, we're created in his image, to live in his presence, right? This is not some ethereal thing, and I hope by the end of this I can really show you that it's actually something very normal for the life of the believer because we're indwelt by the Spirit of God, right? The psalmist in Psalm 1611 said this, you will show me the path of life, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So if we're in the presence of God and God is with us, if we've given our life to Christ and the Lord is with us always, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake us, we should learn and should enjoy being in the presence of God every day, every moment. Now we have our ups and downs, right? But generally, if we learn how to live in that place, we're far happier and far more at peace, right? We can live in that joy. We can learn to live out of that place. We see in the scripture, Adam and Eve in Genesis walk with God in the cool of the day. They lived in close relationship with God, or they lived with his presence, if you will. He came and spoke to them, and all that, up until the fall where they gave into temptation and sin entered, there was unbroken relationship. Now through Christ, the second Adam, if you will, there is restored fellowship and there's restored relationship. So we can live in this place of communion with the Lord. This is what the Holy Spirit has done. The Holy Spirit through new birth has born, made us born again. The Holy Spirit lives within us and now we're able to commune with God and learn how to live out of his, out of his presence. Now I want to ask you a question. Can you remember when you first experienced the presence of God or became aware of God's presence. You may not have been a Christian yet. Just think for a moment. When was that? I was recalling and thinking about this this week. I remember I, I'm originally from Iowa in the Midwest, but lived in Ohio through a lot of my grade school years and then eventually last few years of junior high, high school in upstate New York before going to the Navy and ended up down in, ultimately down in Florida. But in my grade school years in Ohio, I can remember, I must have been in about second grade. I have a brother that's 11 months younger than I am. We're Irish twins. And uh, we spent a lot of time together. And I remember the house there in Ohio that we lived in, it was, we had a big Buckeye tree in the backyard. And there's a reason the Ohio State team is named the Buckeyes, okay? <laughs> big Buckeye tree. We had a we had a sandbox, Tonka trucks in that thing and all that. And we were walking. I was about second grade, maybe eight years of age. My brother would have been about seven. And we're walking on the side of the house going towards that Buckeye tree in that sandbox. They go, Brian, God's here. Do you sense God? He's looking at me. No. He later would become a Christian too. But I'm like eight years old, and I'm like, I sense God's presence. In fact, I'm just telling the story. The hair is starting to stand on my arms. It was one of those moments where I just could feel the tangible presence of God, and I didn't have much of a grid for it. We were a Catholic family, went to Catholic Mass, but I can guarantee you most of those services, I didn't really experience the presence of God. I was actually afraid of God. 
But in that moment, I remember it was something so wonderful. And I look back on it, that began for me, now again, lots of ups and downs through life, but that began for me, began for me a journey. I want to know God. I want to know this creator of the universe. I want to know this one that put the stars in the sky and named everyone. The one that knows the sand and the seashore. <laughs> that knows our thoughts are sitting down and are rising up. I, I want to know him. Not just about him, I want to know him. And in that eight-year-old understanding, that was the beginning of a journey. What about you? Maybe you're still on that journey. I'm here to tell you today, he's very near. He wants to know you intimately and wants to be your closest and best friend. The Lord wants us to learn to commune with him in his presence. It's in God's presence, again, that this fullness of joy is discovered. It's in his presence that his power is imparted. I've discovered that if we want to prevail in spiritual power, it requires a lifetime of intimacy with God. Amen. It's not a one and done impartation service, although there are times when God just comes through the laying on of hands and it can be powerful. But generally, it's about cultivating a lifestyle of living in his presence and walking with him in that place of unbroken fellowship. God invites us in James 4, 8 to draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That draw near, that phrase, that literally means to get closer. This is not heavy-duty Greek here. <laughs> Just come closer. We're instructed in Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. The phrase be still literally means to cease from striving. Have you ever strived in your life? Let's be real here today, okay? I think every one of us has. But to be still means to let go of the striving. It means to let go and relax, to tune out the distractions of the world and listen to the quiet whisper of God. It's getting still and coming into a place of rest. Yes. It means resting in his presence. The result is that you will know he is God. And you will know he is near. The English word know is from a Hebrew, Hebrew word, yada. And it is an experiential knowledge of God. It's not being still and knowing about God. It's being still and knowing God experientially. You see, Bible reading and prayer are, are not enough. We must take time alone with him, not asking for anything, but more of him, yes. more of his fullness, more of his presence in our everyday lives. Amen. You see, God releases power through us as we dwell in intimacy with him. Some of the most powerful times of prayer I've had isn't just intercessory prayer and and I've written, you know, on prayer quite a bit, taught on prayer quite a bit. I love intercessory prayer. I love petitionary prayer. It's very, very important. Keep doing that. But certainly learn, though, how to just come into times and have moments with the Lord. I encourage, in fact, every day to some level and say, Lord, I just want to be with you. Lord, come and rest on me right now and then just sit and be quiet. Lord, what is it that you have to say to me? What's on your heart? How do you see this situation, God? How do you see where I'm at right now? You see, the natural outworking of his presence is becoming more like Jesus, walking in both the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit, and you'll see more supernatural things begin to happen as well, more miracles, right? Typically for me, and for those of you maybe that are new, you're not familiar with this, but Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 some nine gifts of the Spirit that are still operation today. One of those gifts of the Spirit is certainly the gift of healing, prophecy, understanding things, but one of them is called word of knowledge, and that is to have supernatural insight about a situation or a condition that maybe has already occurred or someone has or, some, or some, someone's going through that you wouldn't otherwise know except that the Lord reveals that. Does this make sense? And so one of the ways that I've discovered for me to most clearly get words of knowledge, although sometimes the Lord will release them literally from the time I'm walking there up to here, but 
Most of the time, it's when I'm sitting and waiting in his presence. And I'll ask him, I say, Lord, are, are, is there anything you want to do today in the service? Is there, is there a word of knowledge? Is there something, you, direction you want to go? And that's usually when I hear those words. And by the way, when I say hear, I mean the language that he speaks to me. Because sometimes he's revealing I see something. It's not always something you hear audibly. And so we learn then how to tap into what God is saying. Now, this may seem too far out for you, but wouldn't you like to know what's on God's heart for you in your life every day? Is, is God so far out there that he's unattainable or unreachable? If God is ever present with this and Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, then shouldn't we expect then the, the almighty God, his presence to, to guide and direct us on a daily ba basis? He wants us to hear his voice. One of the beautiful things is people have learned to spend time in God's presence. Many have experienced inner healings, physical healings, restoration of relationships, fear dispelled, depression leaving, transformed lives. See, there, again, there are different forms of prayer, but waiting prayer, learning how to wait in his presence, has more to do with receiving from the Father as opposed to petitioning or intercession. Jesus is our example. We see in Mark 1.35, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. We see also in Luke 6, 12, now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. All night in prayer, communion. Then in the morning, up before daylight, solitary place, more communion, more prayer. You see, I believe that Jesus wasn't just in intercessory prayer in those moments. I believe he was asking the Father certain things. But I believe he was also just communing with the Father, letting the Father pour into him, letting the Father reveal to him what was on the Father's heart. Remember, Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. So that means he had to be in a place where there was more than one-way dialogue. It had to be two-way dialogue. And so that's what the Lord would have us is to get to that place where we're learning how to abide in his presence and allow this two-way dialogue to unfold as a normal, natural thing of being a believer and a lover of Jesus. Jesus needed refreshed after pouring out and ministering to others. And if he needed refreshed, what about you and I? How much more do we need poured into and refreshed by the Father? So what does it mean to wait on the Lord in his presence? To wait in God's presence is to rest in his love rather than to strive in prayer. To wait in God's presence is to rest in his love rather than to strive in prayer. Again, if you've heard me teach any length of time, you've heard me talking about the effectual, James 5, 16, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. There's a, an earnestness this there. There's an intensity there. There's, there, there. It may look like striving at times. There, there is something that sometimes comes from deep within, a burden that happens. That type of prayer is needed. But equally as important is these times of learning how to rest in the presence of God where we're not striving for a breakthrough, but rather we are receiving the breakthrough that has already happened. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was finished. And so while, yes, there's a place of intercessory prayer for a breakthrough, and we need that, there's also a place of tapping into what he's already accomplished on the cross and learning how to receive of his love of his refreshing, of his grace. When we're going through the most difficult times, and we all go through them, the hardest times, that's the time we need to do this the most. As a person learns to rest expectantly in God's presence, maybe prostrate on the floor, maybe laying on the floor, maybe in a most comfortable chair, just inviting the Holy Spirit, often you know, he'll just begin to hover over you, revealing more of God's love and renewing and beginning to repair areas of your life. 
as you allow the Lord to take control. And by allowing him to take control means you're sometimes willing to just be silent. It's a spiritual discipline that sometimes we've lost in the modern church. Silence and solitude are important. So learning how to wait in that place, even if you don't get an answer right away, even if you don't get the goosebumps right away, realizing, saying, okay, God, I'm in your presence. I know you're here. Even if I don't hear anything, see anything, or feel anything, God, I know you're with me. And that's enough, God. Because there are times in our life where we have to faith it. You know what I mean by faith it? No matter what words others can give us to comfort, no matter what, how much we read in his word, no matter how much we even hear from him, there are just times we have to take it by faith and say, God, I don't understand, but I trust you. I trust you. It's going to come in moments like this. So we begin to let him have control. He then begins to draw uh, the person either to what he's something in Scripture, maybe some internal audible impression, picture in the mind, whatever, he'll, he'll begin to unfail it. Let me read a story out of the book of Acts. Many of you probably are familiar with this. Uh, you know, they've already been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'll mention that maybe here in a moment. But we see that there's this unsaved, righteous man named Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. You familiar with the story? We'll pick up in Acts chapter 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. So he's basically a Roman. A devout man, verse 2, and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms or charitable gifts generously to people and prayed to God always. So this is an unsaved man who's righteous and devout, and he wants to give gifts, he wants to help people, he's trying to do things the right way, and then God intervenes in his life. Have you ever heard a story of how God has intervened in someone's life and they came to know Christ? We hear stories like this, by the way, over in the, a lot of the Islamic nations right now. Many of the testimonies of people coming to Christ is the Lord suddenly appears to them. The Lord's not thrown off by someone's lack of, quote, salvation as we understand it. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, unsaved man. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he explained all these things uh, to them, he sent them to Joppa. That's where Peter was. The next day as they went, verse 9 on their journey, they drew near that city. Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, about noon. He became very hungry and wanted to eat, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. So now we've got Cornelius. He has his visionary encounter. God shows him what to do because he's been waiting in prayer on God. Now all of a sudden, Peter, he goes up to pray, right? He's just waiting on the Lord. All of a sudden, he goes into a trance. Now a trance is sort of like a still-like state where there's usually a visionary encounter that's unfolding, right? Right? And again, this may be foreign to us in our modern culture, but actually, if you look through the scripture, you see that it's ha it happened quite a bit. And if you look through church history, you find that, that it still happens. One of the pioneers in Pentecostal movement, modern day Pentecostal movement, was a woman named Mariah Woodworth Eder. Have you ever heard of her? And she was actually um, uh, more of a, from a Methodist holiness background, and God began to speak to her. She was married, had kids, and her husband wasn't really in the right place. And the Lord began to speak to her about a call in her life in ministry, and she resisted it for a long time. And finally, she said yes to the Lord. And once she did that, God began to visit and minister through her in powerful ways. One of the th she would go into towns and villages and places. Uh, you know, this is more like in the 19, early 19th century, and the Holy Spirit would just fall in power. She was known to go into trances where she would be speaking and all of a sudden just stop for moments still. 
and all of a sudden come back and pick up where she was. Reports of people all of a sudden overseas in different places, uh, uh, you know, Mariah, listen, about such and such time and such and such date, you came and visited us. She was like, no, I didn't. I was in such and such place in the United States at that time. Am I freaking you out on Sunday morning here? <laughs> there, there are just sometimes things we don't understand, but God, who is God, can do all things. Amen? Peter falls into a trance. He saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now remember, the whole issue is, should we go to the Gentiles or is salvation to the Jews only? So God's interrupting his inaccurate understanding of theology. He has a limited understanding of what God's promise, the messianic promises were. Yes, to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile. And God's breaking in and breaking in in a way that Peter never saw. Peter said, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. In other words, that what the Gentiles would eat. And a voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into the heaven. And just for time, we won't get into it. But basically, all of a sudden, the men that Cornelius sent, all of a sudden, they arrive at the door, and the, the Spirit of the Lord says to Peter, he says, okay, I want you to go with these men. He ends up going back with them to Caesarea, which is north on the seacoast there of uh, Joppa, south of where Caesarea was. He gets up there, and you know the rest of the story. The Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and his whole household, and they all get saved and filled with the Spirit. And all of a sudden, now the gospel is being taken to the Gentiles. And so the Lord has his ways, always. Well, let's talk about what, how, how did Peter get to this place? How did he become such a spiritual giant, right? <clears throat> well, he was baptized in the spirit, wasn't he? What did Jesus say in Acts 1-5 before he ascended? For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Then in Acts 1-8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So this English word baptized comes from the Greek word bapto, and it means to dip under to die, to immerse, to sink, to drown, to bathe, to wash. And it's also from the Greek word baptizo, which means to baptize or immerse. One understanding in the ancient Greek was that like of a sunken ship laying on the, on the bottom of the sea and being completely submerged under, in the water. Completely, the waters become one with the wood. The wood's beginning to decompose. It's like it's still a ship, but it's there. But now the, it's taken on the, the very character of that water. Does that make sense? Another example, and in, in fact, ancient uh, pickling recipes were found in Greek using the same words about baptizbo, baptizo. And it literally, like if you remember how you make cucumbers or make pickles out of cucumbers, you take a raw cucumber... You dip it in boiling water to blanch or sterilize it, and then you put it in the brine, and you leave it there for a period of time. And what happens? That cucumber no longer is a cucumber. Oh, come on, everybody. This is not that hard, okay? <laughs> it becomes a pickle. Whether you like pickles or not, you get the idea, right? Sweet pickle, if it's sweet brine, dill pickle, if it's dill brine, whatever it is. And so what happens when we get completely immersed with this understanding of baptizo, we're soaked in the brine. In this case, it's the Holy Spirit. And what happens during this waiting or soaking in his presence, if you will, is that all of a sudden now we're taking on the flavor of Christ, the very nature of Christ. The more that we soak in his presence, and believe me, I can always tell when I've not been waiting enough in the Lord's presence. some of our flesh starts to come forward. And so what's the answer? We've got to get back in his presence. We've got to make the, the flesh subject to the spirit and spend more time in his presence. And so this is what happens. We learn how to wait or be marinated in the presence of the Holy Spirit so we no longer taste like our old raw nature, but the flavor of Jesus himself. And so this is what we need to focus on. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so that 
that's what it means to soak in the presence of God or be waiting in the presence of God. So here's the next question. Why do I need to wait in God's presence? Why do we really need to wait? First of all, as I said right at the beginning, each of us has a deep need to be close and intimate with God. Again, we are created to experience God, not just to gain knowledge of him. And so the Bible is a book of experiences, not just theology of men and women of God whose lives were changed through divine encounters. Our theology is certainly based on God's word, but our experience with him make his word come alive, right? And so we begin to learn how to live out of that place of experience with God. And this, this throws off many in modern-day church culture, uh, even Protestant churches, because many of us are so ingrained, it's the word, it's the word, it's the word, and experiences downplay because, after all, we don't want to be deceived by experience is the common logic. Yet that's not what's the, the case of the Bible. The Bible is both obeying God's word and allowing his word to build and strengthen us, but it's also the word leads us into an encounter with God to experience the living God. David experienced the living God. He didn't run against, a, you know, go against a lion and a bear because he just had a word. He had the presence of the living God with him. He didn't go against Goliath just because he had some theological understanding. He, <coughs> excuse me. He went against Goliath because he knew that God was with him, and if God was with him, he could overtake this giant, right? Same is for you and I. 17th century monk, Brother Lawrence, I'm uh, familiar with him. He wrote a book in the you know, middle 1600s called Practicing the Presence. Funny thing about Brother Lawrence, like many of the monks and those in, during that monastic movement where they sort of, you know, sequestered themselves to get closer to God, all those kind of things, he discovered that they had so much work to do, hours a day. Yes, they had times of prayer and that type of thing and study of God's word, but they had so much work to do just to survive, you know, gardens, taking care of those, you know, food preparation. All, all, I mean, it's just the days were long, all this stuff. So he learned how to practice God's presence even when he was peeling potatoes. He learned how to practice God's presence when they were washing dishes or taking care of the grounds at the, you know, monastery, whatever, right? Does this make sense? And so it's a great little book. You should get it sometimes. It's widely available. Practicing his presence, right? And so there's real important things. So the more that we learn how to practice the presence, not just in getting in a quiet place in the morning or evening or whatever that is for us, but learning how to practice his presence through the things you do at work. Now, here's what to think. You don't want to be at work staring at your computer and go into a trance for three hours. Your employer may not understand, including the church staff, okay? Was, you can tell me you're praying, but I may know better, okay? But, but we can, we can be, well, you're a three-part being, your body, soul, and spirit, right? You can learn how to live and pray without ceasing, be in the presence of God, and at the same time go about other activities. Amen. We can learn how to do this, right? So that's point number one. Why do we need to wait in God's presence? We have a deep need to be close and intimate with God. Secondly, we need to be refilled by his presence. Have you ever felt like you're just running on empty? Okay, I'll try over here because I know I think this side's more honest. Have you ever felt like you're running on empty with God? Yes. Okay, they're more honest. All right, so if we, look, we all have been, but you know, and we see right in the book of Acts. Remember what happened in Acts chapter four? They so I just read you a little bit about what happened in Acts chapter one and two. They get baptized with the Holy Spirit. God bursts the church. All of this stuff's happening. The Spirit of God is moving, and then all of a sudden they get some persecution. In Acts chapter four, verse thirty-one, this is what happens. Uh, Peter and John come back to the disciples. They said how they were persecuted. Don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And then it says this, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Amen. Now, wait a minute. This was the same group that got baptized in the Holy Spirit two chapters earlier. So what happened? They needed another encounter with God, didn't they? Let me unpack this a little bit. They prayed, shaken by God's presence. They were filled with the Spirit again. They went out in boldness. That's the result of their prayer and spending time with God. The Greek word there, literally, it means to cause something to be completely full. To fill completely. 
to fill up. The same word is used in Matthew 27, 48. Taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine. Remember when Jesus was on the cross? When the soldiers took a sour, that, that sponge full of sour wine and put it up to Jesus, right? Same understanding. That sponge was saturated, filled. And so if you think of washing your dishes, what you, you take the dry sponge, it takes a moment to run the water over it. In fact, by the way, the first couple of minutes you run the water over it, it kind of water bounces off of that dry sponge, doesn't it? This is why we have to wait in the presence of God for a while. It's not 15 or even 30 minutes sometimes. In fact, some of you may need to soak for about four hours. <laughs> I may need to go for six anyway, so. <laughs> we spend time in his presence, and all of a sudden we begin to, we get filled up like that sponge, and so the more the water rolls over that sponge, it begins to get filled, right? This is the understanding there. As they prayed, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, much like that sponge that just begins to absorb the water, and now you can just wring it out, Right? And so that's why, it, so it, for reasons we don't fully understand, I've heard, you know, Pastor Bill Johnson say, well, you know, why do we got to get filled again? Because we leak. <laughs> that's probably one of the most interesting definitions of this I've heard. So all I know is we need to constantly be in the presence of God and just get refilled and refilled and refilled and refilled. In fact, Jesus spent time with the Father every day. And if Jesus had to do it, maybe you and I need to do it, and maybe we need to make it more of a priority. Amen? So another point here why we need to be filled is healing of life's hurts and disappointments. Do you ever have any of those? You don't have to be completely honest here on Sunday, but we all have. Like an onion that is peeled layer by layer, so anger, unforgiveness, bitterness, fear, other inner healing issues are often removed layer by layer as we continue to rest in his presence. Sure, we may need others to help minister to us. James, it says, we're to confess our faults or shortcomings with others and pray for one another. You may be healed. This is part of that process. But there are times we just need to wait in God's presence ourselves. You can get ministry. You can read God's word. But there are just times we just need to let the Lord begin to minister to us at a deep, deep level and take off those layers and layers that we all have. And here's the interesting thing. Uh, you can go through seasons where all of a sudden God is doing that and you get in his presence and all you do is weep. That's okay. I've seen sometimes where people for a couple of years, they, just in the, they get in the presence of God or they come into me, they just weep. That's Okay. Let God do whatever he needs to do. And, you know, you can ebb and flow. You can have a season in your life where maybe you go through something or whatever, and it's like you just need to get back in that place of the presence of the Lord and let him minister to you, and there's tears with it. There's pain. There's hurt. It's all coming. Let it out. In fact, I think it's best to do it alone with God. And then you may have seasons. <clears throat> It'll take you from that. And the joy is so sweet and so amazing. You're just like, how could I go from that to this? But it's still the Lord. Amen? Amen. So just allow him to do whatever. I won't get into all the scripture. Another reason why we need to wait in the presence of God, it's biblical. I'll write all this up in my article that I send out this week. And, you know, if you don't get subscribe to that, you just scan that QR code and you can sign up for the article. It goes out every week. But for example, Psalm 23, 1 through 3, Psalm 4, 4, Psalm 37, 7, Psalm 27, 14, <clears throat> excuse me, Isaiah 40, 29 through 31, Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Hebrews 4, 9 through 11, just to give you a few scriptures on why it's biblical to wait in the presence of God, okay? All right, I'm giving you the what, why. Let's talk about the how. How do I wait in the Lord's presence? We'll try to wrap this up here, okay? First, Get in a comfortable, quiet place. Perhaps sit down, lie down, or sit. The main thing is to be in a safe, quiet place where you can focus on the Lord and receive for him, from him. Now, I have my home office, and I got a place where going on 22 years now, I've 
can sit there in that corner and just pray and wait on the Lord. It's wonderful. You may not have that. You know, you may have to, you know, depending if your living situation, you may just have to use a living room, bedroom, whatever, but just a place that you can get along with the Lord. But here's the other thing I've discovered over the years. I also can receive from the Lord. In fact, oftentimes some of my greatest revelations and encounters with God have been out in nature. I do really well walking outside. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'll jog. I don't have earbuds. I walk. I don't have earbuds. If you do that, that's fine. Be blessed. For me, I don't. Part of the reason, I just want to hear the birds. I want to look at the sunshine, and I want to hear what God may be speaking to me. That's me, though. I grew up in a time when you didn't have all the earbuds and all that stuff, so I got used to just listening to my own voice, okay? Just, just mine and God, not, not other voices, okay? So it's all good. And, um, but out walking, I remember one time uh, we had gone through a real, we had come back off the mission field uh, from Haiti in uh, 1994, 95 time frame, and we had gone through, you know, it was a challenging situation, but then, you know, we were doing, we were doing better in a whole lot of things and ministry and life and all this stuff. And then we had a really hard time we went through in 1997. <laughs> and it was a challenging time. It was stressed our marriage. It stressed everything. We went through a challenging time. And I remember <clears throat> Carol and I, we took a missions trip. Our daughter was about uh, three years of age. And we took a missions trip down to be with a friend down in Guatemala that we knew from our hometown there in Florida. And we went down there. And I was discouraged about a lot of things, right? The, the difficulty we had in Haiti and some of the things that didn't happen. And now we just gone through this situation, and I'm, and I'm out for a walk one day there in Guatemala City, Guatemala, and I'm out walking. <clears throat> I said, Lord, there has been prophecies, things you've spoken over our lives about going to the nations. We've gone to some of the nations. We've ministered, but Lord, I believe there's so much more, and yet there's been this pain, this heartache, this disappointment, this stuff we've gone through, God. We're not through it yet necessarily. So where are we, Lord? I remember walking by this house has beautiful bougainvillea bushes, you know, the pink, pink, reddish flowers, you know, and, and a walled, nice-looking house. And all of a sudden, I start having this vision of the Lord. And it was powerful. I'm walking. I'm just walking. It's on a Saturday morning. And, you know, and all of a sudden, I see the Lord, and he's, like, just huge standing over the earth. And he's standing, like, one foot, you know, in North America and one foot kind of in the Atlantic Ocean. He's just standing there. He goes, come on. Come on. Come with me. He goes, we're going over towards Africa, and we're going over to Asia. And he's like, takes one stride, and we're like over to Africa. He goes, he goes, listen, going with me and going to the nations is not hard. When it's my time and my way and my provision, he goes, it's not hard. Don't lose sight of what I have spoken to you. Don't look at the pain, the sorrow, the things you've gone through. Rest in what I've promised you. It reverberated within me. And he takes another stride. He's an Asian. And he smiles. He goes, keep coming, you know. And it's like, this thing's unfolding. It rocked me. Even as I'm telling you about it today, it's like it's reminding me once again, listen, the promises, the things that he speaks to you. You can go through hardship. You can go through heartache. You can go through everything. But if you hold on to him, <laughs> but when we strive, and we try to get ahead of God and his timing and his ways, and we get in the flesh, it doesn't go well. Secondly, again, how do I wait in the Lord's presence? So find that comfortable place, number one. Get with him, whether it's walking, home, setting, whatever. Secondly, begin to set your affection on Jesus. Begin to focus on him. You may want some intimate worship music playing. It'll help you quiet your soul. Focus on the Lord Draw near to God, right? Just get focused on him. Third, begin to worship him. Tell him how lovely he is, how much you love him. I like to pray the Lord's Prayer. You know, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. I like to begin that, right? Just start right there. I've also learned to worship the Lord in both nat my native English language and also the language of the Holy Spirit. I've learned how to just, there's a place of benefit there. Yeah. I invite his presence and his kingdom to come. I welcome the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I literally will just sit there. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. Yeah. And, and again, it doesn't mean that your life it has to be all together. Maybe you're not all together and you're going through something. You say, Holy Spirit, I welcome you. Help me. Rest on me. Give me insight. Give me understanding where I'm at right now. Right? 
And so you just begin to humble yourself. Then I ask the Holy Spirit to search my heart, to confess any revealed sin or wrong attitude and receive his forgiveness. I, I quote this verse a lot, but 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to learn how to live in that realm and believe it by faith. Otherwise, we will not get close to the Father. We'll stay further away from him instead of getting closer, right? And I've learned just how to then present myself being alive from the dead. Paul talks about this in Romans 6.13, and yielding myself unto God and to his righteousness. And the fourth thing I like to do is after a few moments and becoming aware of the Holy Spirit's presence, I may feel this weightiness upon my body, maybe tingling of my hands. Like when we were praying, began to pray for those with cancer earlier, my hands started getting really hot. That's when I know there's a healing anointing. He's, for me, he, that happens a lot, right? But a lot of times when I'm just soaking in the Lord's presence, it's like I do begin to feel like, like the hair standing on edge or just, I just begin to sense a weightiness of his presence and he's very near. And I embrace that. I, I learn to kind of go with it, right? Sometimes I may begin to cry or become a no, emotional as a the Lord comes and he's just kind of pulsating around me and through my heart. Sometimes I may begin to feel joy that begins to well up. I just, whatever it is in the moment or the season of life that I'm in, I just learn to kind of go with it, right? I tell the Lord, God, I want more of you. I want more of your presence. Fill me with more of you. Give me an undivided heart, Lord. Give me clean hands, pure heart. And I may repeat this many times as I wait on the Lord and focus on him. And it may take some time, but it's worth the time. I begin to recall experiences with the Lord, maybe prior visions, words, healings that I've seen, miracles that I've seen, breakthrough with provision, whatever has happened, where God has manifested himself in wonderful ways, I begin to thank him. It creates more of an expectancy and awareness of his presence in those moments. I just stay quiet and wait on him. And should I begin to hear his voice and can begin to speak to me in other ways, a lot of times I'll journal it, sometimes I don't. But keep a journal hand, write it stuff down. But I also learned that God doesn't just speak, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, just in audible words or inner words. It, it, oftentimes he'll speak through impressions, through visions, through uh, just different ways. And I call that the language of the spirit. And I learned, I've learned over the years what that is for me. And each of us have to learn what that is for us. Now, here's the thing. No vision, no dream, no word you think from God should ever con uh, uh, contradict the scripture. You realize that, right? Amen. It shouldn't do that. And so we want to make sure it falls within the tenor and the nature of Christ and the nature of God's word. Even when Peter was being directed there to go to the Gentiles, God wasn't rebuking them for having a Jewish understanding of where salvation was come. He was helping enlarge the understanding of what the promises were through all the prophets that would also go to the Gentiles. Does that make sense, right? It's a difference. And so I, you just get in that place. And lastly... Uh, number five, I've learned to f as I'm focusing on him, again, receive what he is giving. I invite him to reveal, to impart, and, uh, and learn. I've learned how to trust him. And I've learned that it's not a program to be managed, but a relationship to be maintained and stewarded over. And so that's important. It's not just about running through a list. Okay, I got my 15 minutes in with God, you know. No, no, no. It's about learning how to wait and cultivate that time with him and, val and valuing that. Amen? So don't be in a hurry, you know. Just, you've got to set some time with God. Listen, if you work during the week and you've got to get up and out the door, you know, spend a few minutes. It's better than nothing. But learn how to spend some protracted periods of time with God and say, okay, God, I'm going to wait on you till I hear from you, till I sense you, till I just get refreshed and soaked in your presence. That make sense? There's much more to it. Again, I'll write it up. Uh, things that can happen, dreams, visions, you know, all kinds of stuff can happen. And so we learn how to experience this presence of the living God. People describe his presence in different ways. To some, it's heat, electricity, shaking. To others, it's lightness, peace, weeping. Experiencing the manifest presence is not the goal, but the gateway to the supernatural realm. It's the beginning. We go into the spirit realm in Christ, we can see him, hear his voice, walk with him, and be empowered with him. And I'll leave you one last verse 
as I close this out. Isaiah 64, 4 says, God acts for the one who waits for him. God acts for the one who waits for him. Do you believe that, church? The Amplified Version says of the same verse, God who works and shows himself active on behalf of him who earnestly waits for him. And he's waiting on us to wait on him, church. Amen? So I want to, as we come into this wrapping up here, uh, I want to, a couple things. If you're here and you don't know Christ, I want to encourage you today, come forward. We'll have the prayer team up here in a few minutes and have someone pray with you to receive Jesus. That's the beginning, right? We can't really know God unless we first give our lives to Jesus Christ and say, okay, Lord, I surrender to you. Fill me with your spirit. I want to walk with you and be your disciple. That's, that's step number one. But number two, for those of you that are here, if you want a fresh and filling of the Holy Spirit, we only got a couple minutes, but I want to invite the Holy Spirit to come and rest on you. Do you have faith for the Lord to touch you right now, right where you're at? And so just close your eyes. It's just, if you're watching online, just get comfortable. Close your eyes. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to rest on us afresh. Fresh touch. Fresh in filling. Just increase your presence, Lord, right now. Holy Spirit, I ask that your tangible presence would deepen for each one. Lord, you know what the need is for each person. Meet them where they're at. Holy Spirit, let your healing balm just be released. In our hurts, disappointments, heartaches, I pray you'd lift off. Holy Spirit, I ask for a fresh strengthening. Strengthen. Power. Encourage. Edify. Comfort. In Jesus' name. More of your presence, God. All the weights, all the cares. Lord, just begin to lift off as they're just waiting in your presence. In Jesus' name. Now what you're experiencing, you can do the same by yourself at home. So I gave you a little taste for a couple minutes. And just carry that on. Let an hour unfold or maybe longer. Say, Lord, I just wait in your presence. Maybe you put some light music on. Sometimes what I like to do is put two or three songs on that I understand the words and then just instrumental. And just wait. How many of you experiencing God's presence? Just raise your hand. I'm just curious. Yeah, quite a few of you. Even if you're not experiencing his presence, his presence is here. So whether you feel anything or not, you are experiencing his presence. Does this make sense? It's, it's really nice in here right now. <laughs> this is way better than a football game, okay? <laughs> Jesus. You doing all right? How many of you want more of his presence? Yeah. So Lord, bless your people. Refresh, strengthen, and Lord, what you've started, I pray for many, just continue and strengthen and deepen. Help all of us learn how to wait on you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Again.
Uh, we'll have the prayer team up here. We've got the coffee ministry in the back. If you're new or a guest, please stop by the Connect, and um, we have a team that will be ready to greet you. You, do, you, are, do, you all doing all right? Okay, I'm just checking on you. I want to make sure you're okay, all right? All right, be blessed. Thanks for coming today. See you next week.